All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to get into Numbers chapter 21, where we're going to have the Brazen Serpent, Sihon, the King of Amorites, and Og, the King of the Giants. All right, so taking the first three verses, uh, this is going to be the defeat of the King of Arad, the Canaanite. So the King of Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelt in the south, heard that Israel was coming on the road to Atharim. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. So the name of that place was called Hormah. So as the new generation of Israel began their approach to the promised land, the new generation encounters their first hostile army, Arad the Canaanite in the south. So after having uh, some men lost to Arad, Israel vowed to God that they will utterly destroy the cities of Arad. That is, they would devote the cities of Arad unto God by completely destroying them. God then granted them victory, right? The Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. It is a strange idea to our way of thinking, but Israel at this time would show that property was completely given to God by destroying it, thus making it usable to anyone else. It was an expensive and wholehearted way to give things to the Lord. This was Israel's way of saying, we're not fighting this battle for our own profit, but for the glory of God. And it was at Hormah that Israel was defeated in their ill-advised attempt to enter the promised land by force after rejecting it by faith. Now God has brought them back into the same place and given them the victory. This is a real turning point for the nation. So Arad was a Canaanite city, and this is about 20 miles east, uh, northeast of Beersheba. These very people, with the Amalekites had destroyed some of the Israelites about 38 years earlier at the very same place in Hormah, which we just talked about in Numbers chapter 14, verse 45. The Lord answered, and Israel destroyed many Canaanite towns. And to commemorate God's faithfulness, they call the region Hormah, which means destruction. And it's probably the reference to Hormah in Numbers chapter 14, which reflects the incident here. All right, verses 4 and 5. Israel, provoked by the difficult journey, speaks against God. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people came very discouraged on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Good Lord. And they had to go far out of their way because the Edomites refused them passage in Numbers chapter 20. In fact, to go around the Edomites, they had to turn back towards the wilderness and away from Canaan, and this was obviously discouraging. They had a reason to be discouraged, but they had no excuse for their discouragement. They face a real challenge and something that is no fun at all, yet they had no excuse for not trusting in God and for not looking at his victory through it all. Sadly, the new generation sounded much like the old one. If they continued in the steps of their fathers, this new generation would be no better able to enter the promised land than the previous generation was. In fact, they perhaps acted worse than their fathers here. In eight previous passages in Exodus 15 verse 24, Exodus 16 verse 2, Exodus 17 verse 3, Numbers 12, verse 1, Numbers 14, verse 2, Numbers 16, verse 3, Numbers 16, verse 41, and Numbers 20, verse 2. The children of Israel are described as speaking against Moses. In those situations, Moses knew uh, in Exodus 16, verse 7 and 8, and the Lord knew in Numbers 14, verse 27, that they were really speaking against God. But the people were not brazen enough to do it directly. Now they are brazen enough because it says the people spoke against God and against Moses, right? And this was a major problem. They were at the threshold of the promised land closer to it than the previous generation of unbelief had been. And now they were beginning to act with the same unbelief or worse. Something drastic had be uh, had to be done. All right. So on this occasion, uh, Israel relied on God, and Israel's vow to devote them to destruction was also in line with God's promise, right? When they destroyed the Canaanites, these Canaanites were to be dispossessed, unable to cross the Edomite territory. Israel had to go around, which meant turning back towards the Red Sea. So the impatience gave way to an open rebellion once more, and contempt for the manna which God had provided was again voiced. The fiery snakes may have been a kind of adder, which we'll talk about here in verse 6 and which is known in the sandy wastes of Sinai and are very poisonous. So verse 6, the Lord is going to send fiery serpents. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. So, 
strange passage, and we're going to look at this really closely. So how were the serpents fiery? Some think they, they were a red color, like the color of fire. Others believe that their bite caused an intense burning sensation, so they were called fiery serpents. Um, these came from God to get the nation's attention at this critical place in their journey to the promised land. If they kept going in the direction they showed in the previous verses, they would never enter in. And so many people died, and these victims were mostly those of the older generation of unbelief, and this was God's final way of fulfilling his promise that they would perish in the wilderness and not enter the promised land. Verses 7 through 9, we're going to have deliverance through looking at the bronze serpent. So therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he will take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent. Pay attention, I'm slowing down for purpose here. And they put it on a pole, and so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, and he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Right. So this new generation was capable of deeper sin, uh, such as openly complaining against the Lord in Numbers 21, verse 5. So they also have hearts softer and quicker to repent, and they quickly humble themselves before the Lord and Moses. And they ask Moses to pray for them, and they know their answer lies only in the saving work of God, and they are not trusting in luck or medical expertise, but only in God. So God commands Moses to make a serpent... And Moses makes it out of bronze, which is Levitical for judgment, to set it on a pole. And those who look upon it could be saved, and they were. And this was an unusual direction from God and miracle resulting. There is no immediate logical connection between merely looking at a serpent on a pole and living, or refusing to look and dying. But God commanded that such a foolish thing be used to bring salvation to Israel. Now what else do you think is a model You know, if a serpent is a type of sin, bronze is a type of judgment, and setting it up on a pole on a hill to be looked at to be saved sounds a lot like an Old Testament type of Jesus Christ who is lifted up on a pole. And this isn't explained anywhere else in the Old Testament. Nobody else explains the bronze serpent on a pole until we get to John chapter 3 verses 14 through 15, where Jesus Christ refers to this remarkable event. Where he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus clearly said that there is a similarity between what Moses did here and what Jesus did on the cross. Right. So how can a serpent have a similarity to Jesus? Serpents are often used of, uh, as pictures of evil in the Bible in Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 and Revelation chapter 12 verse 9. However, the bronze is a metal associated with judgment in the Bible because bronze must be made by passing through the fires of judgment. So a bronze serpent does speak of evil. But evil, having been judged, such as Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us on the cross. And our sin was judged in Jesus. A bronze serpent is a picture of evil judged and dealt with. We would have wanted to diminish our sense of sin and put the image of a man upon a pole. Man, we might say, is some good and some bad, but a serpent we can more easily see the badness thereof. In addition, if the serpent lay horizontally on a vertical pole, it's easy to see how this was a visual representation of the cross as well. However, many traditions show the serpent being wrapped around the pole, and this is the source for the ancient figure of healing in medicine, a serpent wrapped around a pole. You may see this in various hospitals. When you see two serpents wrapped around a pole, that is the old Greek god, uh, I believe it's Hermes, and it's the god of commerce, which is ironic. But if it's a single serpent on a pole, it is a Numbers 21 reference. So the people were saved not by doing anything, right? But by simply looking to the bronze serpent. They had to trust that something as seemingly foolish as looking at a serpent on a pole was enough to save them. Surely some perished because they thought it too foolish to do that. As it says in Isaiah 45, verse 22, Look at, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. We might be willing to do a hundred things to earn our salvation, but God commands us only to trust in him, to look to him. Charles Spurgeon gave his life to Jesus Christ after hearing a message on Isaiah 45, verse 22, and hearing that text applied to this account of Moses lifting the serpent in the wilderness, and the people looking and living. 
Spurgeon was so impressed by this picture of the gospel and salvation in the book of Numbers that he chose an engraving of Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness as a logo for his publications. When Israel was complaining against the Lord and against Moses, they were not looking to the Lord they, uh, the way they should. They were looking at themselves, and they were looking at the hard circumstances. But they were not looking to the Lord. What will it take to get you to look to the Lord, right? So God commanded Moses to make an image of a serpent. And even though such images were seemingly forb- forbidden in Exodus 20 verse 4, actually, actually Exodus 20 verse 4 forbids the making of idols. And this was no idol. It was a symbol sanctioned by God that they could look to it in faith and be saved. Sadly, even this God-ordained symbol was made into an idol later on. In the reforms of King Hezekiah later, he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made for until those days the children of Israel burned incense to it and they called it Nehushtan in 2 Kings chapter 18 verse 4 fallen man can take any good thing and glorious thing from God and find an idolatrous use for it so they took a symbol that was for Christ and they made it into an idol we have to understand the difference all right so how strange all this uh, Moses should make another serpent yet it was the serpents that caused all the trouble to begin with and there was not enough of them in the camp already no explanation or rationale through the whole uh, Old Testament and later Hezekiah had to destroy the bronze snake because it became an object of idolatry. <clears throat> and in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, we'll get the why. Okay, so now all these things happen unto them for examples. Who's them? Israel. Examples for who? All of us. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So to the Hebrew mind, prophecy is pattern. You get the order of the camp in Numbers 2, the manna in Numbers 11, Aaron's rod in Numbers 17, water from the rock in Numbers 20, and the brazen serpent in Numbers 21, right? So looking at John chapter 3, verses 14 through 19 again. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. And it wasn't until Nicodemus comes to Jesus one night, and this strange enigma is explained. And it too was a messianic prophecy, a means of salvation. A man is not lost because he rejects the gospel. He is lost to begin with, right? The word loved is agape, and... And the wages of sin is death in Romans chapter 6 verse 23, right? Sufficient one serpent for the entire camp by faith alone, right? It was a universal need. It was by God's grace. It was available by faith. It was one remedy for all. That's also covered in John chapter 14 verse 6 and Acts chapter 4 verse 12. It was free for all. It was sufficient. All right. Now, verses 10 through 20, we're going to have the journey into Moab. Now the children of Israel moved on and camped in Oboth. They journeyed from Oboth and camped at Ij Ibarim in the wilderness which is east of Moab toward the sunrise. From there they moved and camped to the valley of Zered. From there they moved and camped on the other side of Arnon which is in the wilderness that extends from the border of the Amorites. For the Arnon is the border of Moab, between Moab and the Amorites. Therefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, Waheb and Supa, the books, the brooks of the Arnon and the slope of the brooks that reaches to the dwelling of Ar and lies in the border of Moab. From there they went to Beer, which is the well where the Lord said to Moses, Gather the people together and I will give them water. Then Israel sang this song, Spring up, O well, all of you sing to it. The well the leaders sank, dug by the nation's nobles, by the lawgiver with their staves. And the wilderness they went to Matna, from Matna to Nahalel, and from Nahalel to Bamoth, and from Bamoth in the valley that is in the country Moab, to the top of Pisgah, which looks down into the wasteland. All right, so besides the names of the places of Israel passes uh, through on their way, 
towards the promised land, the brief passage of poetry are also recorded, giving a sense of elation that they must have felt. So some have mentioned of the books like this in the Bible, right, the books of the wars of the Lord, as an argument that the Bible is an incomplete book and it must have been supplemented by something like a Book of Mormon, which is incorrect. But the mere mention of a book by the Bible doesn't mean that there are, that the book belongs in our Bibles. We would love to see and read such ancient literature lost to history, but anything in such books inspired and important is recorded for us in passages like Numbers 21, verses 14 through 15. In fact, Paul quoted from a pagan poet in Acts 17, verse 28. It certainly doesn't mean that everything that a pagan poet wrote was inspired by God, or that our Bibles are incomplete without the full text of what that pagan poet wrote. So the route Israel took was difficult to reconstruct since many of the places can no longer be identified. The next place mentioned is uh, Ij Abarim in the desert on the east side of Moab, but otherwise unidentified. And from there they traveled to the Zered Valley, which they formed uh, the border between Moab and Edom. And there is a more complete itinerary in chapter 33 where Zalmanah and Punan are listed between Hor and Oboth. And the route seems to be east of Edom because of uh, Punan or Finan evidently was the site of copper mines in that region. The material for the bronze snake may also suggest a proximity of copper deposits. And Oboth was likely at the northern end of Ereba, north of Punan. And this is supported by the fact that all the tribes turned north after paralleling the Edomite hill country in the southerly direction in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. So the Israelites successful journey through Moab to that point was celebrated in a poem originally found in Lost Text, the Book of the Wars of the Lord. The first line of the poem is now incomprehensible unless Wahab is a place name, and perhaps the uh, quatrain is saying that the Lord had enabled Israel to take Wahab, the place of Supad, along the river and the wadi systems or the ravines along the Moabite border. So Ar, or El Mishnah, was a city on the northern part of Moab, about 10 miles south of the Arnon. It's reference to verse 17 there. And then, leaving the eastern Arnon Valley, the people moved on to Beer, well, and moving still northward along the desert, they came to Matna, or Kirba El Medina, Nalil, and Bamoth, which was eight miles uh, south of Heshbon, and finally arrived at the foothills of Pisgah. Pisgah was a few miles due east of the northeast edge of the Dead Sea, almost to the plains of Moab across from Jericho. And at last, Israel seemed to be on the verge of invasion and conquest of the Promised Land. So, long story short, we have a big itinerary of their journey through. All right, verses 21 to 23, you're going to have the challenge of the Amorites. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, saying, Let me pass through your land. We will not turn aside into fields or vineyards. We will not drink water from wells. We will go by the king's highway until we pass through your territory. But Sihon would not allow Israel to pass through his territory. So Sihon gathered all his people together and went out against Israel in the wilderness. And he came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. All right. So as with the case of the Edomites earlier, the Amorites would not let Israel pass through their land, even though the Israelites promised it would be of no expense or trouble for the Amorites. So he gathered his people together and went against them. So while Edom passively refused, the Amorites actively attacked Israel and King Sihon led the battle. The incident is even more interesting when we consider Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 30. But Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass through, for the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might deliver him into your hand. So God hardened the heart of Sihon so he would provoke the battle, so he would lose, so Israel would gain his land. And it was not unrighteous of God to harden the heart of Sihon because Sihon was not originally favorable towards Israel, and God did not make him be hardened when he was really wanted otherwise. But that wasn't how it happened. In hardening Sihon, the Lord gave him over to, his, uh, to the evil heart that he desired. Verses 24 through 32, King Sihon and the Amorites are defeated by Israel. Then Israel defeated him with the edge of the sword and took possession of his land from the Arnon the Jabbok as far as the people of Ammon. And from the people of the Ammon was fortified. So Israel took all these cities and Israel dwelt in all the cities of the Amorites and Heshbon and all its villages. For Heshbon was the city of the Sihon king of the Amorites who had fought against the former king of Moab and have taken all of his land from his hand as far as Arnon. Therefore, those who speak in Proverbs say, Come to Heshbon, let it be built. Built, let the city of Hehan be repaired, for the fire went out from Heshbon, a flame from the city of Sihon, it consumed Ar of Moab, the lords of the heights of the Arnon. Woe to you, Moab, you have perished, O people of Kamash. 
and he has given his sons as fugitives and his daughters into captivity to Sihon king of the Amorites. But we have shot at them, and Heshbon has perished as far as Debon. And when we laid waste as far as Nopa, when it reaches to Medba, thus Israel dwelt in the land of the Amorites. Then Moses sent to spy out Jazer, and they took its villages and drove the Amorites who were there. All right, so we now better understand God's favor and mercy to Israel. Before they faced the hardened warriors of Canaan, God gave them smaller foes and smaller battles to fight, and we see how foolish the unbelief of the previous generation was. The land of the Amorites later becomes the possession of Israel. The tribe of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh received this land. Passages of poetry are meant to show what a mighty people the Amorites were, and in contrast how glorious Israel's victory over them was. So churlishness and unprovoked violence bring their own punishment in Proverbs 16, verse 18, and Proverbs 18, verse 12, and Numbers 21, verses 21 through 31. So Israel gained all the Amorite territory from Arnon to the Jabbok. Josephus says that every man in the nation fit to bear arms fought the Amorite army against Israel in Antiquities 4, section 2. So Moses had used an Amorite poem ironically to describe Israel's destruction of the Amorites. Sihon's former conquests had been immortalized in poetry in verses 27 through 30. The poet sang about the destruction of Ar of Moab by Sihon, who evidently had rebuilt the Heshbon and made it his chief city. He had then marched against, uh, marched south against the Moabites, the people of Kamash, the principal Moabite god, and had taken them as captives, and everything had been destroyed by Sihon. From Heshbon in the north to Debon in the south, including places in between such as Nopa, Sai Unknown, and Medaba, seven miles south of Heshbon. All right, verses 33 through 35, the defeat of King Og in the land of Bashan. And they turned up and went by the way to Bashan. So Og, king of Bashan, went out against them, he and all his people, to battle at Edri. Then the Lord said to Moses, Do not fear him, for I have delivered him into your hand, and with all his people on his land, and you shall do to him as you did to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon. So they defeated him, his sons, and all his people. And there were no survival left for him, and they took possession of his land. This is another battle that Israel did not provoke, yet Israel was more than up to the challenge, and God uh, it sees God win a glorious victory. And this land also becomes part of Israel and a portion of the inheritance of the Transjordan tribes. The new generation of children of Israel are making wonderful progress into the promised land and experiencing victory after victory. Yet their challenges are not over, as the subsequent chapters are going to show. So, the country from uh, Jabbok to Hermon, right, Bashan or Gilead, was at this time ruled by Og, and he's the last of the Rephaim, and he also tried to prevent the progress of the Israelites, but was utterly routed, and all his cities and territory fell into the hands of the Israelites. So Deuteronomy chapter 3 verses 1 through 13, when we turned and we went the way of Bashan and Og, the king of Bashan came out against us, he and all his people to battle at Edri. And the Lord said to me, fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land into thy hand. And thou shalt do unto him as thou did to Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. So the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og also, the king of Bashan and all his people. And we smote him until none left uh, to him was remaining. And we took all his cities at that time, and there was not a city which we not uh, took not from him. Three score cities, all the region of Argob, the kingdom of Og in Bashan. All these cities were fenced with high walls, gates, and bars, beside unwalled towns a great many, and we utterly destroyed them, as we did to Sihon, king of Heshbon, utterly destroying the men, women, and children of every city. But all the cattle and the spoil of the cities we took for a prey to ourselves, and we took at that time out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites the land that was on the side of the Jordan from the river of Arnon unto Mount Hermon, which Hermon the Sidonians called Siron, and the Amorites called Shinar. All the cities of the plain, and all Gilead, and all Bashan, unto Salca and Edri, kings of the cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan, for only Og, king of Bashan, remained in the remnant of the giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. It was not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon. Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth thereof, after the cubit of a man. And so it was a very large bed. And this land which we possessed at that time, from Or, which is by the river of Arnon, and half Mount Gilead, and the cities thereof, gave eye to the Reubenites and to the Gadites, and the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave eye unto the half tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Argub, with all Bashan, which is called the land of giants. All right, so let's look at this. You won't really understand this unless you understand Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, right? 
So Genesis chapter 6, verses 1, 2, and 4. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. Right? Two different groups, sons of God and daughters of men. We're going to look at that closely here in a minute. And they took them wives of all which they chose. There were Nephilim in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. All right. Daughters of Adam were not just daughters of Cain, right? Adam had daughters in Genesis chapter 5, verse 4, and that's where Cain got his wife. They took all of what they chose. It doesn't sound like the girls had much of a choice in the matter. When you look at the Hebrew, Beneha Elohim means sons of God. Benoth Adam means daughters of Adam. We have two separate groups here. People and superhuman... Uh, Hyperdimensional beings here. Sons of God is I was speaking of, like you would say, angels, direct creations of God. They left their estate. All right, so the Nephilim. The Nephilim means the fallen ones. Nephal means, it comes from the root word of Nephal, which means to fall or to be cast down, to fall away from, or desert. Ha Jeborim means the mighty ones, right? And so in the Septuagint in the Greek, you have gigantes, which they were giants during these times, or which comes from the root word of gigas, or earthborn. So genages is the same word in the Greek mythology for titans, creatures emerging from interbreeding of the Greek gods with human beings. Genia means breed or kind. The English word genes and genetics come from the same root. So the New Testament confirmations of this in the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? You can see Jude chapter, uh, let's see, Jude verses 6 and 7, 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 19 and 20, 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 and 5, and you'll have the even the unique use of the word Tartarus. So the angel view of the church fathers uh, you know, is carried by Philo of Alexandria, Justin Martyr, Arrhenius, Athenagoras, Tert Tertullian, Lactanius, Amros, and Julian. Modern scholarship to back this is G.H. Pember, M.R. Dehan, C.H. McIntosh, F. Delitz, A.C. Gabalian, A.W. Pink, John Donald Barnhouse, Henry Morris, Merrill Unger, <laughs> Arnold Fruchtenbaum, Hal Lindsay, and Chuck Smith. Right, very prominent names. So the post-flood Nephilim were referred to as the Rephaim, right? So remember in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Also after that, in Genesis 14 and 15, you had the Rephaim, the Imim, the Horim, and the um, Zam Sumim. Other references of this post-flood Nephilim is Arba, Anak, and his seven sons, the Anakim, encountered in Canaan. That happened in Numbers 13, verse 33. Og, the king of Bashan, obviously in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11, and Joshua chapter 12. You have Goliath and his four brothers, which David is going to go against later in 2 Samuel chapter 21 verses 16 through uh, 22. That's the uh, Goliath's brothers and 1 Chronicles chapter 20 verses 4 and 8. And so you have these strategies of Satan, right? First, in Genesis chapter 6, you have the corruption of Adam's line. And that's when he, Satan's followers try to disrupt the, the pure human line here by intermarrying. That's why you have the sons of God taking the daughters of men. All right, in Genesis chapter 12 and uh, 20, you have Abraham's seed, where Satan tries to thwart and disrupt Abraham's seed, knowing that the Messiah would come out of that. You had famine in the land in Genesis chapter 50, try to starve him out. You had the destruction of the male line in Exodus chapter 1, Pharaoh's pursuit in Exodus chapter 14, populating of Canaan in Genesis chapter 12 verse 6, and you have it against David's line in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Attacks on David's line, right, because out of David's line would come the Messiah. Uh, Jehoram kills his brothers in 2 Chronicles 21. The Arabians slew all, but Ahaziah and uh, Athelia kills all but Joash in 2 Chronicles 22. Hezekiah is assaulted in Isaiah 36 and 38. And you have Haman's attempts in Esther chapter 3. The New Testament strategies by Satan. You have Joseph's fears in Matthew chapter 1. Herod's attempts to kill the firstborn in Matthew chapter 2. At Nazareth again in Luke chapter 4. Two storms on the sea in uh, Mark chapter 4 and Luke chapter 8. Remember that was a supernatural storm because even the local fishermen were uh, terrified. There's something supernatural happening there. You had the cross, obviously, and then the summary and is carried in Revelation chapter 12, and he's still not through. So the bulls of Bashan, let's talk about this. In Psalm 22, you get a first-hand account of Jesus Christ on the cross written by David. 
700 years before it happens. But there's an interesting line in there where it says, Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. Psalm 22, verse 12. And I would like to know the connection between Bashan back here in Numbers and the reference that David uses with Jesus Christ on the cross with Bashan in Psalm 22, verse 12. So in Enigma, what does the Golan Heights, Hebron, and Gaza Strip have in common? Right, They were the areas that Joshua failed to completely exterminate the Rephaim in Deuteronomy chapter 20 verses 16 through 18 and Joshua chapter 15 verse 14. You will notice that the Gaza Strip, Hebron, and the Golan Heights are still areas in Israel today that are remaining in dispute. It's a hot topic by the UN. It's a hot topic between Palestine and Israel. And that's because they completely, um, they didn't completely exterminate the Rephaim back in the Old Testament. And it's still something they're having to deal with today. Very interesting. And that'll tie up Numbers chapter 21. Next time we'll get into Numbers 22, the prophet Balaam. Thank you for joining me.